Greetings, everyone. Uh, welcome to this Embedded Linux Conference Europe uh, session. So uh, today I'll be talking about supporting hardware accelerated video encoding with mainline. Um, this is especially about stateless codecs, which are not yet supported in mainline. So we're going to see that with the Hentro H1 example that I'm going to give many more details about uh, throughout this talk. But first, uh, let's begin with a bit of details about me. So I'm Paul. Um, I work at Bootlin as an embedded Linux engineer where I do some uh, expertise, especially development. Um, I also give a, a training um, about graphics uh, display and rendering. So I try to work with open source as in contributing uh, many of my changes to upstream as much as possible. I've worked on the Sidious VPU driver for the decoding part uh, in V4L2, so I worked on MPEG2 and H265. Um, also did some work to the Sun4 IDRM uh, driver, which supports um, all winner SOCs, just like the Sidious driver. Um, so recently I also worked on MyPy CSI2, which is kind of a recent interface for cameras. Um, I live in Toulouse, in the southwest of France, where one of our um, offices is located. So let's begin with H.264 encoding. So first off, why do we need to uh, encode video? Well, um, the fact is that pictures are pretty big and they take quite some size in memory. So uh, if we make a quick calculation for a 10 minute example at 1920 times 1080, take a uh, 32 bits per pixel uh, frame buffer for that. We want to have 30 frames per second and we make the calculation that would be about 142 uh, gigabytes just to store that 10 minute video. So we definitely want to compress that and reduce this size, which is kind of the, the uh, core uh, point of video encoding. So the idea is with that we're going to use lots of different methods to kind of compress the data, reduce the size. Um, and, but keep in mind that doing this uh, requires some heavy calculations. So there's always some overhead to encoding and decoding. And there's, of course, the main concern of encoding, which is uh, keeping a good visual quality uh, for a given size. So there's a trade-off here that we want to keep under control uh, to kind of have uh, a result that suits the use case that we have. So there are very different ways to encode videos, uh, lots of different formats. So these are called video codecs. Um, I've given just a, a few examples here. So H.264 is one of those video codecs. They contain uh, both compressed video data, which is um, the, the actual data that is used to uh, recalculate, recreate the frame, but also some metadata that kind of explains how the frame was encoded and so how it should be decoded. So this is kind of an encoder or decoder pipeline configuration metadata uh, that is definitely necessary because there are lots of different ways to um, encode H.264. There are lots of different features that can be used or not. Uh, so lots of conditionals here that all need to be kind of laid out with the metadata. Just the codec data itself is called the bit stream, and uh, this pretty much contains all of the, the video data that is compressed. Uh, and this bit stream is put into a, a bigger uh, container, which uh, has this video data, uh, which might also have some audio or some subtitles, for example. Uh, and this is what makes an actual video file that you can, that you can use uh, on your computer. So H.264 uh, is known as many different names. Uh, it was standardized by ITUT as H.264, uh, but it also was standardized by ISO as MPEG-4 AVC, aka MPEG-4 Part 10. So MPEG-4 itself uh, can actually mean lots of different things. Uh, so this is why we're going to talk about H.264 or AVC, uh, just to make things clear. It's really used a lot nowadays uh, on, the, on the web, especially, uh, but just for streaming generally, or uh, just video transmission that can be compressed. It's really everywhere now. So it's used for the TV with an Intel station where you only update half of the lines at a time, but uh, mostly what we're going to look at today is progressive mode where pictures are frames uh, and not just fields uh, of interlaced uh, content. So H.264 has lots of uh, compression features, some of which can be kind of complex uh, to implement or that might require lots of, uh, lot of logic. 
There are different profiles of H.264 that each kind of enable a subset of features. Uh, so for example, the baseline profile is quite simple and is a good fit for easy uh, uh, kind of implementations. Uh, and high profile requires lots more logic and has more features and more flexibility to encode videos efficiently. There's also a concept of limits uh, to set the maximum uh, kind of bit rates for the video. It's also about dimensions. And there are some annex specifications as well. Um, for example, SVC for scalability, so you can add more temporal content or spatial or uh, better quality. So uh, basically you add extra data that you can decide to decode or not. MVC is another extension uh, to show multiple views uh, in the video. So this is mostly used for stereoscopy, which is basically 3D, where you have to show one different view to each eye. Uh, so those are the, the main extensions that are used. So H.264 has specific semantics and uh, basically uh, specific uh, units, which are called network abstraction layer units, uh, that each have uh, a, a data header basically with a specific type that is specified, with, which kind of indicates uh, what, the na what the data of the unit is. Uh, so for example, there are some metadata NALUs, such as the uh, sequence parameter set, uh, SPS. So this is metadata for the whole sequence. There's also the PPS for each picture. Uh, so this is for the metadata and we can also find actual coded video data which is called the slice data. It's important to keep in mind that the metadata is uh, just a series of bits that need to be understood according to the, the syntax of H.264 uh, which is really bit aligned and uh, often conditional. There's a specific format called NXB, uh, which will basically put a prefix before the beginning of each uh, NALU, so that it's easier to just find the start of the next one. One important idea in H.264 is macro blocks, which are basically subdivisions of the picture uh, into uh, blocks of 16 times 16 pixels. These are grouped as slices, so basically the coded information uh, in the uh, coded slice data NLU will be composed of data about macro blocks. And there are different types of slices which we're going to talk about just next. Okay, so let's look at some compression techniques that are used in H.264, uh, beginning with color subsampling. So this is the idea that uh, we're going to affect less bits to uh, color information versus luminosity information, just because uh, the human eyes are uh, less sensitive to a difference in uh, color than they are in luminosity. So this is done using an appropriate color space, um, for example, YUV Rec 709. So we're basically going to convert a, a regular RGB uh, image in sRGB color space to this YUV Rec 709 color space, which, use, which uses a, a YUV color model that splits uh, the components between luminosity and, and two uh, chrominance channels. And uh, we're basically going to subsample the chrominance channels. For example, with 420, we're going to subsample horizontally and vertically by two. Uh, so we can basically divide by four um, the number of bits per pixel on each of the chroma uh, uh, planes or components. So in the end, this gives us 12 bits per pixel, uh, which kind of reduces the size by two if we have a 24 bits per pixel uh, sRGB input. So this is great because uh, it's not really very noticeable to the eye. Uh, so this works uh, kind of well. So another compression technique that is at the core of H.264 encoding is quantization. So the idea of quantization is that each macro block is converted into frequency domain using a discrete cosine transform operation. So uh, this is just a frequency-based representation of the picture uh, in 2D. Uh, and then we're going to apply a quantization step, which is just a number that we will, uh, that we will use to divide each uh, of the frequency space coefficients. Uh, before rounding them and just keeping those quantized values. So the idea is that uh, the bigger the quantization step, uh, the more we um, lose quality, basically. We lose information on the frequency uh, space coefficients.
the the um, quantization step itself is indexed by a quantization parameter, uh, which we can use. Sorry, which we can use uh, just to uh, control the quality of the encoding. So another uh, compression technique in H.264 is intracoding, which is basically using redundancy within a picture, like a wall that would have a constant color without much changes. And so we're basically going to use prediction patterns, for example, with directions, just to deduce the values of the neighboring pixels from the previous pixels. So this is just one way to reduce the amount of information uh, that we need to transmit. So another important compression technique in H.264 uses the fact that uh, in video, subsequent pictures are often mostly the same in the sense that only a small part of the picture will change or some, something will move, but not the whole scene at once. And the background often remains the same. So um, instead of coding the information of each picture each time, we're just going to code the difference between the pictures. In order to do this, motion vectors are calculated to also indicate the movement of parts of previous pictures. So at decode time, these pictures will be used as references to calculate the next picture with the difference between the two pictures. This is called inter-picture prediction. Less information to carry, so this is good for compression. Motion vectors are calculated between the picture and indicates kind of how a part of the image will move or change uh, in the following frames. So in order to do this, the references need to be kept decoded in memory. This is a visualization of motion vectors using FFplay from FFmpeg. So this basically indicates how the elements of the pictures have moved from the previous frames as they were calculated with just the motion vectors. More specifically, there are two types of uh, inter-frame prediction in H.264. The first one is called backwards prediction and it's used in p-slices. This one will just use up to 16 of the previous pictures. And there is bidirectional prediction, which is uh, in B slices. And this one will use the previous pictures, but can also use following pictures, which need to be placed before the B frame in bitstream order. So in this case, the display order will be different from the bitstream order, because the B frame will be decoded after the B frame, but displayed before it. In order to do this, an intracoded picture needs to be uh, present first. This kind of sequence is called a group of pictures, where we have an intra picture starting and then inter predicted frames such as P frames or B frames. Keep in mind that using bidirectional inter prediction uh, will produce some latency because you have to reorder the bitstream uh, to have the B frame after the P frame that it depends on. So you will basically create some extra latency when decoding. The last type of compression techniques that we're going to see is just entropic compression, which is a very common uh, form of compression that will just assign shorter symbols to frequent occurrences in the input data. So this is a kind of looseless compression that works pretty well for video. There are basically two main types of entropy coding that is used for the quantized discrete cosine transform coefficients. So the basic one that is used in default is the context adaptive variable length coding, CAVLC. But there's also a more advanced way that is uh, enabled, at least in high profile, uh, which is called context adaptive binary arithmetic coding or CABAC. So the first one is some kind of Huffman coding, while the second one is arithmetic coding which is more complex, but provides better results. So one of the key aspects in H.264 encoding is called rate control. So this is basically controlling the trade-off between the quality and the bitstream size. So there are lots of things to take into account when doing this, and it really depends on the use case and what we want to do. There are different rate control modes uh, that apply different policies, which will basically all control the quantization parameter QP, which basically determines the quality of uh, the output. In the first mode, CQP, we just have a constant QP for every frame, so we have a constant quality, and that, that's pretty simple. 
In CRF, uh, we have instead a constant quality, which is not the QP directly, but just some parameter that will be used to find the most appropriate QP. Uh, for example, in iframes, which will have a slightly lower QP to have more quality. And then uh, that will be a bit higher in uh, predictive frames because it's less important that they have good quality. Then there is CBR, uh, where we try to keep a constant bitrate across the group of pictures. And ABR, uh, which is kind of the same idea, but over the whole sequence, so over the, the whole video file, which can be kind of hard if you don't analyze the sequence first. So this is a good fit, for example, for storing movies uh, in a given size, while CBR is good for streaming, where you want to have a constant uh, bitrate. Uh, CRF is kind of a good way to keep a constant quality, so for example to archive uh, a video or something like this. And CQP is basically not a very good fit and it's best to use CRF. In order to evaluate the quality, we can use a PSNR metric, which is a pseudo signal to nose ratio. So this will just give us a number that indicates uh, how much quality we have uh, on, on the signal when we compare it to a reference. So now I'm going to show you a video where we use CRF mode and we just increase CRF. So we just worsen the quality uh, as time goes. So uh, we're going to look at the QP, we're going to look at the signal to nose ratio, and we're going to look at the size uh, of that uh, single frame encode. Starting from about 24, I can notice the difference. And now the quality is significantly worsening with each increase of the CRF. So we can see the size that is getting lower and lower, but the quality is also uh, really bad. Okay, so now we're going to look at the Entro H1, H264 encoder. So we're going to look at the hardware a bit closer. So the Hentro H1 is kind of a common uh, hardware H.264 encoder. It can also do VP8 and JPEG. It is found in a few embedded ARM socks, uh, lots of rock chips. Uh, actually, rock chips uses the Hentro H1 a lot on many, many of its socks. But it's also found on one of NXP socks, the IMX8MM, uh, not the double M, because the single M doesn't have this encoder. Depending on the version, it can do 1080p at 30 or 60 frames per second with lots of H.264 uh, profiles, including uh, high and main. And it can also do MVC stereo, so it can encode 3D, uh, but I've, I haven't used it for that. So just a quick a block diagram from the IMX8MM manual. We can see basically different locks that are used for the uh, encoding, which kind of are uh, the different steps of the encoding techniques that I've described uh, before. So the uh, H1 is a stateless hardware implementation, meaning that it has no microcontroller, no firmware running. It's just hardware, just uh, logic. So uh, as we could see in the diagram, it has a preprocessor that can do lots of things, including like cropping, rotation, uh, scaling, color space conversion, uh, and also image stabilization, which I haven't tried yet uh, either. So it will spit out slice NLUs. So this means no metadata. Uh, it needs to be recreated. And there are some constraints on uh, specific parameters. So these are just examples that I found. Uh, so these values in the SPS and PPS need to be set precisely to that. Otherwise, the slice NLU isn't going to decode correctly and it's not going to work. It doesn't do B slices, uh, only I and P. So this is kind of a good fit for camera-based recording where you don't want to have the extra latency of making a B frame. So it's easier to just do GOPs with IPPPPP and IPPPPP, and that's kind of how it goes. So no support for B slices there. It will take references for P slices that need to be stored in specific reconstruction buffers. So you cannot use the input buffers. You have to use kind of the decoded version of the encoded stream uh, because that's what's used for the enter frame prediction. Uh, you cannot use the input. So you kind of also have to allocate specific reconstruction buffers to, to, to keep the decoded references around. Uh, if you want to use uh, Kabak, that's supported, but you also have to provide lots of values in tables in a specific DMA buffer.
So the H1 has some internal rate control mechanisms, which are kind of more advanced than just controlling QP. Uh, QP itself is set to a base value, and you can also set a min and a max. That will be kind of the clipping points throughout all of the operation of the internal rate control mechanisms. They are not actually used anymore, but I'm still going to describe them, uh, just because it took me quite some time to kind of get around them. So the first one is called min absolute difference. It's basically about setting a threshold for differences in the pixels of the input and output. So you can basically set a threshold value, and if that value is reached at some point during the encoding process, it's just going to apply a delta to the QP that you can configure. Then the more advanced mechanism is the checkpoints mechanism. The idea is basically that you configure checkpoints at each regular number of macro blocks. So you might want to split it evenly across the number of macro blocks uh, with up to 10 uh, checkpoints. So at each checkpoint, it will basically uh, calculate the number of non-zero quantization coefficients that it has so far. And you actually give it a target for this number of non-zero coefficients. Then it will calculate the difference between the target and the count. And then it will evaluate the uh, difference between the target and the count. That will give it an error. And you can basically put different uh, deltas of QP depending on the error. So this kind of allows you to dynamically increase or decrease quality depending on the number of coefficients that you already have. So in my experience, this kind of helped with the uh, encoding process, especially for constant bit rates. And the way that it works is that there is some feedback data that you can use to basically make this a control loop when controlling these different uh, thresholds and different errors and uh, uh, levels. Quickly, the feedback data of the H1 is the following. So you have the sum of the QP of each macro block, which you can use uh, given the number of macro blocks to have some kind of average QP, uh, which can be useful. Um, you have the number of total non-zero quantization coefficients, so that's kind of at the final checkpoint uh, at the end of the process. Uh, then you get the value at each checkpoint, which you can use to kind of give a future target in the checkpoint method. There's also the number of macro blocks under the MAD uh, threshold. Okay, so now uh, let's take a look at the integration of this uh, hardware encoder with V4L2. I'm going to start with stateful encoding, which doesn't concern our hardware, but is kind of what was already implemented to handle uh, H.264 encoding. So there's a specific pixel format for the H.264 bitstream. With stateful encoding, it produces both the slice data and the metadata. Uh, but in our case, we only have the slice NLUs, so no metadata. There are a few drivers that currently implement this using the V4L2 M2M framework. They use some generic V4L2 controls uh, to configure the encode run. Uh, for example, the profile, uh, the level, but also some specific features like the entropy mode. Also to configure uh, rate control, like the bitrate mode or the specific bitrate. And some uh, specific drivers also have specific controls, like this one for the MFC uh, driver. So usually in these uh, stateful implementations, we have a microcontroller with a firmware that will basically do all the states and reference management, as well as uh, all the rate control implementation. So this isn't such a good fit for encoder because there are lots of features that are currently not in the V4L2 API uh, that are needed for stateless support. So on the Entro H1, lots of parameters can be set to kind of control the encoding and which feature to use. But some of those also need to be set to specific values for the bitstream to be valid. So we can't just take any kind of PPS or SPS or slice header. Now in the stateless case, um, the state is tracked a bit by V4L2 and a lot by user space. So uh, we're using the media request API, just like in uh, stateless decoding, uh, to tie the buffers and the parameters, which are also V4L2 controls. We need to take care of the reconstruction buffers that need to be attached to the input buffers. And we also need to take care about the references that uh, we need to use. Now, rate control in the stateless case can basically be implemented by the V4L2 driver, which will read the feedback data itself and apply some algorithm to do rate control. 
or it can be left to user space by providing the feedback uh, data as uh, v4l2 controls, for example, and uh, let user space uh, kind of deal with that feedback data. There is already some existing Android run reference code out there. For example, on Chromium OS, where it's used with a downstream uh, kernel driver that is uh, pretty much stateless. There's also user space implementation for the rate control part especially, uh, which is available as a libv4l2 plugin implementation. Then on the other hand, there is Rockchip that has its own implementation for its own uh, downstream kernel, which is called MPP, and it also supports the Hentro H1, which is used a lot in Rockchip. So the approach that was taken to support this encoder was to use the mainline Hentro driver, which is in uh, staging, uh, that supports uh, decoding with the Hentro G1, which is kind of the decoder counterpart to the H1, and the two are often found together. So I worked on adding H.264 encoding to that driver, uh, basically by looking at the Chromium OS and MPP implementations and kind of following the same logic. I kind of simplified the rate control algorithm, but it doesn't give such bad results, uh, so I'm not too unhappy about it. Uh, it was done using the media request API, so really just the same as what the Hentro driver was already using for the decoding part. The rate control, uh, which was constant bitrate, was implemented fully in user space, so the feedback data was provided through controls and retrieved uh, from user space after each encode run. So if you want to look it up, it's on github.com slash bootlin on our Linux tree. Uh, there's a Hentro H.264 encoding branch where we have the kernel patches and I've also pushed uh, the user space side, which is the uh, mostly the rage control implementation and just a generic test tool for the uh, Hentro encoder. This is what the uh, user space API looks like. So you ha we have the encode parameters that take various fields from NALUs. So we have the slice parameters, the PPS parameters, also a single uh, timestamp for reference. Then on the right side, we can see rate control encode parameters with QP and the different thresholds and deltas and etc. Uh, and we also have the encode feedback, which is what we get from the registers uh, of the H1 encoder. So this works, but the structures are not very generic and they are only listing parameters in fields that are quite specific to the Hentro. So instead of that, a more generic V4L2 control-based approach would be to kind of reuse the uh, existing stateful controls and add extra ones for the things that could be missing or the features that can be configured and that currently don't have controls, uh, but also add specific controls to handle references. And then for uh, rate control, there are two major approaches which could work. Uh, the first one would be to do it in user space, which would require generic controls, but this is quite possible because we don't actually have to use the internal uh, hentro specific rate control mechanisms. Just providing the QP and being able to control the slice type or the size of the GOP and things like this could be enough. And we could also provide some generic feedback data, like the number of non-zero coefficients or the QP sum. Uh, these look like things that can be generic and that can also be obtained on uh, other hardware. The downside is that it might encourage proprietary implementations. So for example, vendors that would only contribute that, that driver without any user space implementation for rate control and then kind of do their own proprietary magic, uh, which wouldn't work uh, in the free world. Doing it in the kernel instead would be probably easier for user space, but would also have some downsides, like uh, not providing user space fine control over what's going on, and the in-kernel implementations might be a bit rough, but it could probably reuse the existing V4L2 controls for rate control.
So this is just some feedback about uh, first implementation that has some issues and that cannot be accepted as is. Uh, but this kind of gives some ideas about what I think would work for a proper interface for status encoders. Um, so this is a uh, discussion that I'm definitely interested in having uh, so that we can eventually clean up that uh, intro encoder code and bring it upstream with a nice interface that may also um, affect other hardware like the Alduino encoder, which is also stateless. Uh, if you have more information about uh, hardware that also falls in the stateless category, and uh, if you have details about what the register interface looks like or some ideas about what a good API to support it would be, um, that's quite welcome. Okay, so that's it for me. Uh, thank you for attending this talk. Uh, it's been a great pleasure. Now, if you have questions or uh, just remarks or things that you would like to discuss, um, I'm available, so uh, feel free. Thanks again, and otherwise, uh, see you next time, and uh, have a great day.